intuitive versus analytical? That's a foolish choice. It's foolish just like trying to choose between being realistic or idealistic. You need both in life. John Gennaro, count me in! Today's first words belong to Dr. May Jemison, an engineer, doctor, and astronaut who in 1992 became the first African-American woman to go to space. But the rest of the words belong to me. Welcome to Divine Intervention, a self-help podcast about basketball. My name is Dan Devine, and before we get rolling here are three things that I am grateful for today. Number one, I get paid by Yahoo Sports to write about the NBA and talk about it into this microphone and into that camera. Pretty good deal. Number two, that I am married to someone who knows me well enough to text me to remind me to stop looking up play-in picture possibilities and go outside to look at the solar eclipse. What a wonderful expression of how vast and mind-blowing our universe is. What a neat incursion of magic and majesty into a Monday afternoon. And what a great reminder that I am a pretty lucky guy, wife-wise. And number three, nearly as important as all that. I can't say more important than all that because of the wife thing. I get to spend part of my day catching up with someone who is on the very, very short list of the hardest working folks in this business. Woo! My guest today is one of the rare sports writers who began a career by being right absolutely positively 100% right when he launched a blog aimed at convincing the Portland Trailblazers to draft Kevin Durant with the number one pick in the 2007 NBA draft. That didn't happen, but he did keep writing. He became one of the leading lights in the blogosphere at Blazers Edge before leveling up to league-wide coverage for CBS Sports, Sports Illustrated, and since 2018, the Washington Post, where he is the national NBA writer, one of the coolest titles in the league. He's the author of the book, Bubble Ball, BAM! Documenting his 93-day stay inside the NBA's Walt Disney World bubble during the pandemic-interrupted 2019-20 season, he is the co-host of the Greatest of All Talk podcast with the wonderful Andrew Sharp. He is a tireless wonder and a total mensch to boot. Friends, a warm welcome for Ben Golliver. Ben, thank you so much for making the time. How are you doing today? Well, I'm doing great after that very, very generous intro. Thank you so much for that, making me sound like a genius and this hardworking guy is fantastic. I, my, uh, you know, my my self esteem is through the roof. My question is, whose self is being helped on this show? Am I here to help you, or did I just get drafted to this divine intervention and you're trying to make me better somehow? What's going on here? What's the dynamic, the vibe? Okay, it's a great question, and we're like 23 episodes in, and I still don't have a great answer for that. Let's uh -oh. go. Let's go with you're helping me, but maybe in the okay. course of helping me, we help each other. You find yourself helped through service. Let's go with that. I love it. I'm ready. Two way street. Let's do this. <laughs> That's exactly right. And Ben, I've asked you here today for that kind of help for me. I lied a little bit. It is about helping me. Um, we are just five days away from the end of the 23-24 NBA season, which means we're about a week away from ballots being due for year end awards. I got the confirmation yesterday that I have one of those again this year which means I have the very bad feeling in the pit of my stomach over here that I used to get before like a final exam where I felt like I didn't study enough. It is award season, which means it's awards anxiety season. So I hit you up mm. because I sometimes find it helpful to talk through these anxieties with smart people who maybe can tell me to get over myself. And you seem like one of those. I think this year's races are actually easier than you might think uh, to dig through. I did go through the process. I don't have an official ballot with the post. We're on the super high horse of like, sorry, we can't decide people's contracts. That's not our job. So I put out my picks uh, in columns like three times a year, right? right. Um, I will talk about them with you, but I'm not officially casting the ballot. So maybe I can convince you to be my surrogate voter. Actually, that's probably against our policies as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we, we'd have to run that up the flagpole with standards and practices and then find out if at Yahoo we actually have standards or practices. But um, if we can if we can figure that out, I think we'll both be going a long way towards solving our problems. Um, we're going to get into all that. But first, here on Divine Intervention, we always try to operate from a place of joy. So, Ben Golliver, what is something from the world of basketball that has brought you joy this week? Well, I got like a 4,000 word email from you about your awards <laughs> anxiety. 
And so I spent all weekend reading through word by word. And I was like, this guy, he does need some help. I do think this is an inv- intervention for him. So I'm going to bring <laughs> awards related joy to you, which you don't, probably don't even think that's possible, given how much you're stressed out about like, where's Kobe White on most improved? Like you're just, you know, <laughs> neglecting your children as you weigh these kinds of conversations. True. So here's what I'm, uh, you know, I- I'm on the show to say. This could be kind of a hot take, but I'm going to say it anyways. The 65-game minimum threshold not only was one of the NBA's best ideas this season, it worked. It was awesome. All the intelligentsia nitpickers on the internet who are taking their cues from NBA stars who want to have a better shot at more money on their contracts were wrong. I'm going to give you a list of a few NBA players you might have heard of, Dan, okay? Some of these are obscure, so just you know be, a, be paying attention. But these are guys who didn't play 65 games last year who did play 65 games this year. And I think the big misconception about this rule was the idea of like, oh, it's about the contracts, all that. What it's really about is the fans paying tickets, going to the arena, and not getting stiffed when a star doesn't play, right? So here's a couple of the names. Stop me if you've heard them, okay? LeBron James, Stephen Curry, Kevin Durant, Devin Booker, Kawhi Leonard, Anthony Davis, Damian Lillard, Zion Williamson and Tyrese Halliburton, one of the number one whiners about this rule in the entire league. All of those guys were on the court for more than 65 games this year and were not on the court for 65 games last year. Now, a lot of people know me as the guy who says the greatest ability is availability, but I do think this is real progress. Having your stars on the court, if you need to have a player participation policy, that means you have a player participation problem. This mm. rule helped fix the problem. I salute the NBA for this rule. I don't care if I'm the only one. All right. There, what do you think? Did I convince you? You convinced me that it's a good thing to have those guys playing more. Absolutely. I, I'm, I'm on board for the idea. If for no other reason than like we don't get to get to the end of the year and say, well, we don't. We just don't know what the Clippers are because we haven't seen them enough. We've actually seen the Clippers this season, whether we actually know what they are or not. We've gotten to see the players play. Um, the general idea of yeah, like this is a that was a fan focused uh, bit of CBA wrangling and saying like you need to get the guys on the court more often because you don't want to have a. There's the national TV component of like you don't want to have as many big marquee games without big marquee stars, but also. The idea of a fan being able to say, I feel pretty confident that when I go to that game, I'm going to spend the money on that game. I'm going to see that guy. And we've gotten more guys on the floor more often this season. Yes, I believe that is a good thing. And it has eliminated some of the names that could make the anxiety more difficult in awards. Like Joel Embiid's not going to be involved in the MVP conversation this year. Kyrie Irving's not going to be involved in all NBA. Donovan Mitchell's not going to be involved in all NBA, et cetera, et cetera. That can have downstream effects of like, are more guys going to qualify for all NBA and thus Rose rule escalators in their contracts that, but that's like, that's a GM and ownership Fans problem. don't care about that. That's yeah. the thing. This needs to be a fan focused league. I mean, even going uh, back to the all-star game and the atmosphere there or the in-season tournament, the semifinals in Las Vegas, where they have to dim the lights so that there's not empty seats. There's a fan problem here, right? You know, and so let's focus on things that the fans will appreciate. This whole idea spawned to me, by the way, because I went to the Lakers game the other night and LeBron was a late scratch because he was sick. And I was like, oh, that's such a bummer. And then I started to think about it. Like, there hasn't been very many of those with right. LeBron this year. He's almost 40. He's been out there entertaining people almost every single night. Now, you can quibble with the quality of the regular season. You know, did it dip? Did it offense get too out of control there for a couple of months? So I'm pretty glad the NBA did uh, bring things back. Uh, with some of the rule changes or the, the way they were reinfor- enforcing them uh, since the All-Star break. Uh, but the fact is the stars have been out there. People pay to see the stars. I think the fans are winners. And um, I don't think the NBA is getting any credit for this. In fact, I think it's the opposite. I think people are upset. Yes. And you're right. It's, it, so much of it comes back to just whose lens are you, you viewing it through? And from the lens of fans, yeah, as long as you're seeing the guys on the court, everything else you can kind of figure out later. And that's the, the been the most important part of it. You mentioned earlier that the Washington Post is on a time moral horse, and so you do not uh, have an official ballot. Um, You did for a couple of years when you were at Sports Illustrated. I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, sorry. I was just agreeing. (laughs) Oh, you were agreeing. Um, When you were back at SI, you did have a a ballot for a couple of years. Um, What was your process like when you were a voter? Were you the kind of person that's like, I'm digging through every number, I'm reading over every column I'm doing, or were you a little bit more intuitive as opposed to analytical in the process to throw it back to Dr. Mae Jemison? 
Well, look, I- I'm right there with you in the, you know, the anxiety, the overthinking, the pouring through the different statistics, weighing things, asking people for their advice. I mean, fundamentally, I try to get to 50, 60 games in person every single year. And I base a lot of my opinions, my takes, my rankings, my award designations on what I'm seeing in person. So I, I kind of start with my own eye test. And I've been covering the league for almost 20 years now, which sounds insane to say, but I trust my eye test. Uh, you know, beyond that, you got to be familiar with the major advanced statistical metrics when you're, you know, trying to weigh very, very talented players like a Nikola Jokic versus a Luka Doncic versus a Shea Gilgis Alexander. I just think you need to know the advanced stats. That's table stakes. I care a lot about impact stacks because, you know, I want to know which players are making their teammates better and which players are contributing to wins. And then obviously I do factor in a team success as well. Availability, health is huge to me. You know, if you're missing 15 games, I'm, you know, I'm definitely not looking at you the same way as I do somebody who's playing 75 plus. Um, And I am though uh, restricting myself only to this season, right? So the idea that like, oh, the voters got it wrong last year. Joker got snubbed. Therefore, like he was the finals MVP. So we have to make up for it this year. I do think Joker's the MVP, but I'm not awarding him the MVP retroactively based on what happened last year or what happened in the playoffs. That's that's sort of my general framework. But there's no it's I mean, this is like jambalaya, right? Like there's not a magical, you know, there, you don't just stick it at one, at one side and it comes out the other with the right answer. Like you got to mix all these things together and feel good about it. Um, I am not someone, I will say this, who will um, just have a crazy take just to have it. Like I thought about coming on here and being like, you know what? I think Chet Holmgren actually is defensive player of the year. No (laughs) one's talking about it. Let's give it to Chet. I feel pretty strongly about where he should be in this conversation relative to how much attention he's gotten on that. Um, But I'm not going to just give him my first place defensive player of the year vote to spark an outrage. That's just not really what I'm about. Uh, Hopefully that makes sense. Definitely. And yeah, I mean, you know, you mentioned the, 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 it's, there's so many different approaches and there's so many things that kind of go into the pot for, uh, each voter. This is something I think you hear a lot year to year where people say, you know, I, we just want there to be standards, you know, whether it's fans or, or, you know, non-voting analysts or whatever saying like, we want, you you want to know like consistency year to year. Like, what is the thing that that's going to be, you know, do you meet these criteria? And if you meet that criteria, then and like I, I get the under uh, the general idea, but if you have that, then what it's going to be is everyone has the exact same vote at the end of the day. And there's maybe already too much of that, myself included. I can be subject, uh, definitely, um, you know, persuaded by other people's arguments. I try not to read and listen to as much until I've actually done my work on it because I don't want to wind up getting swayed like that. I want at least if I'm group thinky just by nature, that's a bummer. But I, then at least it's my own work, right? Um, but the idea of like, if you, if you are having a specific criteria for what constitutes valuable, everybody will, then we can't argue about it. I don't think the league would want that anyway. I think the league likes that we argue about it. I think the, the general, <laughs> like, like it's part right. of the process that we don't have exactly the same way of viewing all of it. And then thus we have different understandings of, of who is more valuable or et cetera, you know, th- than others. But that, that I, I kind of wanted to bring up. So this year is interest is interesting in that way you said you know you mentioned you think that new goal is probably going to get the mvp this season the last few years we've had some kind of heavyweight fights on that you know there was westbrook harden going back a handful of years and Giannis harden Giannis lebron before the bubble and the last couple of years obviously Jokic and bead is sort of the centerpiece of that Giannis on the conversation as well and beads are not, not going to be in the conversation this year because of the 65 game limit he said uh asked about the race over the weekend after he came back the quote was, that conversation has been toxic for a long time, but I'll be honest, this year has been kind of boring. There's not enough toxicity going around. He said it like he says everything with kind of a smirk on his face and a little you know, gleam in his eye. But do you think there's something to that? Do you feel like this time around, it maybe hasn't been quite enough furniture moving around and people mixing it up in that, that sort of debate? Look, I mean, the MVP debates have just gotten so nasty um, in recent years. I will take the less toxic version than the more toxic version, although I realize that's kind of counterintuitive if you're trying to get people to read your call a bit click and listen to your (laughs) analysis and so forth. But it's been too much. I've kind of opted out of it the last couple of years because I think it's gone to uh, you know, some really inappropriate places, frankly, especially when it was coming to the criticism that Nikola Jokic uh, faced last year. 
I, I will say this just to be brutally honest, like there's a couple of people who have won MVPs in the last 10 years where if I know people voted for them, I will judge them for the rest of their life. It's like, all right, well, you're that guy. Cool. Really awesome. You know, and I just, you know, I, they're now in the doesn't know ball camp for me. And so I realized <laughs> that is a toxic stance to take. And that's part of the reason why I opted out because I don't like that version of myself. Uh, so that's where I'm coming from. Uh, but I do think it's Joker this year. Like, I, you know, in I guess the downside is that Embiid and I think his fans were actually maybe bringing a lot of the toxicity and maybe that's what he's missing mm. because it was also like people sort of hyping him up. Uh, but I give credit to the, uh, you know, the other fan bases. I've heard a lot of Mavericks fans riding for Luka Doncic pretty hard. Uh, same thing with the Oklahoma City Thunder fans and Shea Gilgis Alexander. Not so much the Bucks fans, a small contingent of very loud Bucks fans asking for Giannis to get his due. I've actually been impressed by the restraint of the Boston Celtics fans, not like you know beating down our door with Jason Tatum arguments. I think they kind of realize that maybe he's actually not that guy. So um, all in all, it's a very neat and tidy MVP race uh, to me this year. And I guess I prefer it that way, you know, it's because I was opting out anyway. So I'm not out there seeking the toxicity. What about you? It sounds like maybe you do want more toxic stuff in your life. Oh, this is, you know, we're working through big feelings and big, you know, big, big challenges that go on inside my brain. I don't, on what, like, I don't love the feeling of no matter who you select, you're going to, you know, receive the vitriol and the bile from whatever quadrant of it. But like, that's also, that's a me problem to some extent. Like that is part of the, you know, you, you mentioned table stakes as far as what goes into your evaluation. Knowing that whoever you didn't vote for, the fans of that team are going to be that's mad right. is part of the thing. Like you have to accept that and just understand that and not let that be uh, defining of your sense of self and worldview. Still working What's on that. What's the biggest backlash you've gotten? Do you remember? Uh, oh, well, I mean, all of every side of the Jokic, Embiid, Giannis stuff from the last couple of years, I've gotten both of that. I voted Giannis a couple of years ago, and then I got called a coward by Bucks and Nuggets, oh, by Nuggets and Sixers fans for not making a choice. <laughs> Right. It was okay. like, like how I abstained from the vote I'm like, right. or I thought Giannis was the best guy. But um, but anyway, which is also but that's part of it, too, like anticipating what that negativity is going to going to wind up being. And then nine times out of ten, it's like if you can just not go on Twitter for a week, you're fine. And that's really where it comes down to is I'm more of a bruise poker, I think maybe is what we're what we're learning here. I'm, I'm interested in, in sort of inviting it in a way that's maybe not so healthy. That doesn't sound healthy. Um, I sort of built up my shield to some of the backlash when we put out our top 100, Rob Mahoney and I, like 10 years ago. Yes. Maybe even more than 10 years ago now. And Dwayne Wade uh, was not in the top 10, if I'm remembering this correctly. And he made motivational wristbands uh, about the snubbing <laughs> and sold them on his website. And we bought them. Who knows how many other people bought them? But we bought the <laughs> motivational wristbands. At that point, I felt like that wristband was like my magic you know, shield, like, you know, nothing anyone says on these awards arguments can uh, pierce me anymore. It, it made me feel invincible. So uh, I know what you're saying, though. Part of the problem, I think, with these last couple of years is that the arguments were so repetitive. You could probably close your eyes and script the 25 uh, replies you were going to get on Twitter to sure. picking Giannis over Embiid or Jokic over Embiid or Embiid over Jokic. Like, it felt like everybody was going through the motions and trying to f find new ways to ramp it up. And to me, like Joker just deserves to be appreciated. This dude's on a crazy, crazy run for the last four years. The consistency factor, uh, how he makes his teammates better, in-game dominance. I think the only other player in the NBA who can say he commands a game as well as Joker at any point of his career is LeBron James, yeah. peak LeBron James. I think there's a real argument now, is, is Joker a better chess master in key moments than LeBron ever was like that's a real discussion to have so I would rather have that conversation which is in its own way kind of toxic because you're getting at the guys who are like sure. king goat 23 like you're getting those guys really fired up when you throw some Jokic comparisons uh, to LeBron but I would rather have those conversations than just the same old back and forth well it beats better on defense well Joker's a better passer we did that for three years man we, we it's done yeah and there is a that's a good way to put it. Like where where this conversation would be had Embiid played, you know, a full healthy season because the level that he had reached before he went down was, I think, better even than he was last year when I thought he was a I, I voted for him for MVP. I thought that was a justifiable selection last season. But the in the absence of that, yeah, you're sort of left with slivers of arguments elsewhere that are all like totally fine, but also totally fine in a way that's like 
that's a defensible second place choice. That's a defensible third place choice, you know? And if, if your big thing winds up being like, well, who's fifth on your ballot? Is, is Tatum get that for best player on a best team? Or, do, you know, do you have the ascent of like a Jalen Brunson going there or whatever? Like if you're at that kind of place, you feel pretty sort of pretty solid about where you are in the top four. Um, I'm wondering, though, because, you, you know, you mentioned feeling pretty sort of sanguine about where that where the main MVP conversation is this year. If you did have a vote this year, are there any awards that would provoke some of that anxiety for you where you feel like I actually don't know where I would land in that particular conversation? So I went through the whole process. I didn't think that there was, you know, a crazy, um, you know, huge debates. I think at midseason, the big debate for me was Webby over Chet. And I was still on Chet midseason because he had played so many more minutes Um, that to me that has flipped. I think that there's. You know, going to be some segment of people who are on even higher horses than me that say, hey, look, winning has to uh, factor in here. Chet's been a massive part offensively and defensively of one of the best teams in the league. He deserves uh, credit for that. And he's trying to play all 82 games coming off of a redshirt year. That's like pretty insane from Chet. So he's got a real case there. But um, I think Webby has solidly answered the bell in terms of being the rookie of the year. And you look at just the base numbers, 2010 and three blocks. He's the first player to do that in the NBA since Shaquille O'Neal in 2000. Are you kidding me? Like, that's not like the first rookie to do it, the first guy under 25 to do it, the first player to do it in basically 25 years. So I don't know how you look past that. And again, I'm not only going off box score stats. you got to take all of it into totality, but uh, it's just been an awesome year. So I think he's kind of solved the trickiest one. That actually left me, and this is pretty nerdy, but like, Third place on the rookie of the year ballot. There are some choices. That was like the one that I was like, all right, I really don't respect a team like the Charlotte Hornets. Like they're not really an NBA team this season. So it's like, are we just going to say like Brandon Miller, we're going to give you like, uh, you know, a purple heart for your courage. (laughs) <laughs> and, you know, you, you were out there every single night putting up big numbers. We feel bad for you. It's not your fault. LaMelo got her. Your coach is leaving. Everything else is falling around you. You get third place. Or do you default to some of these other guys who may be uh, or more role players for their teams, but, you know, put up really nice advanced stats because they just really thrived in their role. I mean, Brandon Miller practically is, you know, number one, number two type guy for a lot of the season. And there aren't very many other rookies who can say that. I didn't know where you landed. Uh, presumably you have Wemby one, Chet two. Where'd you land third for rookie of the year? Yeah, I, I'm still working through most of the, like the final things here because I'm doing, I uh, will write the column for it. I think probably for Thursday or Friday, it's going to go up before the actual end of the season, I believe. But so um, that's uh, my my sense is it it probably will be Miller for the for the purpose of like you had to shoulder a a number one load in a way that probably no uh, other people didn't. And then I'd written about him recently as like the like the silver linings for your worst teams in the world. And he was basically like you showed an example of how you could be either as a one or as a complimentary player working off of a more ball dominant player when LaMelo was there. It was really brief, but you kind of see the outlines of where that is a helpful player. And I think he's shown a lot already. He's ahead of schedule on defense too, which is difficult for a rookie wing. Um, But yeah, I mean, if if your argument there, you know, there will be people from Miami saying like, Jaime Hawkins Jr. had to play like major starters minutes on a team that was ravaged by injuries all season long. You know, he deserves, you know, consideration in in that discussion. Uh, Also, I just looked back because I blew my mind like, when Benyama is for the season is a net negative because of how de- you know how desperate uh, the beginning of the year was in San Antonio as they were like going through the point Sohan experiment and everything else. They've won his minutes for the last 41 games, like say going back to uh, January 1st, I think they're plus 29 with him on the floor. So like the component, as you mentioned, like how what are you contributing to winning? One of the worst teams we've seen in a very long time wins when he's on the floor, which is something to be said for that. Well. And you've seen the on-off splits with him defensively, where it's like basically the worst to the best as soon as he steps on the court. And that's a pretty common thread for guys who win defensive player of the year or like in MVP conversations over these last years. Like you get those huge swings. And sometimes that says, you know, something about who's playing behind them in San Antonio. That obviously says a lot about his teammates. But you don't just accidentally stumble into that as a rookie. And he totally matches the eye test. I mean, I think there's a really good chance he could win uh, more career defensive player of the year awards than Gobert, which is pretty wild because Gobert is probably about to win his fourth. Um, I also think there is a case like in a vacuum, 
last three months of the season, he is just the best defensive player in the NBA or the highest impact defensive player in the NBA. I don't want to shortchange Anthony Davis because I still think like if I had to pick one guy for a playoff run from a defensive standpoint, I'm taking Anthony Davis. But that's the kind of you know territory Victor's been in here these last couple of months. You know, I do my top 100. I don't want to like scoop myself. Sure. There's a really good chance he lands in the top 10 next year. And I don't think yeah. I've ever had a second year player. I don't rank rookies because I don't think it's fair to them or sure. the audience because it's just projection. I don't think I've ever had a second year player in the top 25. And I've been doing it, you know, more than a decade. I think Luke and Zion were among the highest guys, uh, but never even considered putting somebody in the top 10. So, I mean, Victor, like he could be on the fringe of the MVP conversation next year. If they make some modest improvements around him this summer, they should be in the play and mix. Like you're saying, they're winning his minutes. So you just ramp his minutes. That could be a team that makes a jump like Houston made a jump, even if they don't spend as much money as Houston made. It's also interesting to me. So going on to the all defensive point, because I think that's a conversation that now this year is a positionless ballot for all defense. And you meant, you know, the the value of impact stats being like that informs how much you are, imp- you know, are, are sort of elevating your teammates when you're on the floor. Uh, you know, how much are you directly contributing to the wins or losses in those minutes? And what we've seen by and large over the years is like centers generally fare the best in those on the defensive end. It's why, you know, Gobert has been such a monster in that conversation. It's why Bam Adebayo, even though he doesn't always like rise to the top in the advanced stats, but it's like the on-off splits where Miami is on defense, et cetera. He always fares well in that. Draymond always fares well in that. In a positionless ballot, like, I again, I, I'm a, you're still working through all this stuff, but like, there's a non-crazy world where you could say like, my top five is all bigs. It's all, it's, <laughs> you know, it's Victor, it's Chet. Don't do it. It's ben, I know, but what I'm saying, so I'm like, there's a non-crazy world for that, right? That, and the NBA is saying to you, do not, you don't have to consider position or don't consider position in this. And yet, like, you have to prioritize and value the guards and the wings at the point of attack, right? Like, even though the oh, impact yeah. stats might lead you in one way or another, like, we, you still have to almost, like, impose a positional spectrum in your own thinking about it, don't you? So here's how I would do it. I actually don't have to go through this exercise with the all NBA teams because I'm not an official voter and I'm only putting out my player ballot, uh, you know, my player awards. How I would do it is uh, using the position list thing to sort out those annoyances where like, is a guy a three or a four or like, is a guy a two or a three? Exactly. How are you categorizing him? If he's a point forward and then like, where do you put him front court, back court? Like those annoying things always come up when you're trying to fill out your all-star ballots or whatever. So I would sort of use that as like kind of a get out of jail free card to resolve those situations. I would still try to build the best defensive team. And if you were trying to start uh, to stop these high level You know, if you're trying to uh, stop a Luka, you're not going to want five Rudy Gobert's, you know, guarding Luka. That's just not the best way to stop him. So uh, with the All-NBA teams, I try to pick out the best possible team of the five guys, even if that means, okay, we have two centers or we have two point guards. That's the way you have to resolve it. And defensively, I would think about how do we stop that All-NBA team? And let's put the guys who give us the best chance to do that on that team. And, you know, you might wind up with three bigs in that situation, you know, and it's like it would be a little bit unconventional. But if you go to five five bigs man you're you're not representing the essence of the sport i'm starting to judge you if you do that dan Th- that but that's why i bring it up that's an intro because that because th- there's a way to look at this that's like that's your putting it's essentially like an expanded defensive player of the year ballot right right and so there's a version of it that's that says no it's about building an actual roster and correct like, so how how do you but there again we talked about there's not guidance on that outside of just irrespective of position, which is what they you know, sort of what they say. But then you have to I kind of like the the anarchy, though, from the organization, from them just saying like, hey, this is on you guys. Sort it out. We're going to like empower the media. Newsflash, the media does way better voting on everything than every other contingent, <laughs> including the fans and the players. The media does so much better voting on this stuff. And so I say empower the media. You should be proud that they're not giving you guidance. Dan. you shouldn't complain about, you know, the SAT, SAT proctors. You should be thrilled <laughs> that you are the decider. You know, you, you, this is your moment. No and just way. make good decisions. That's all. I know. Well, I, I, I try my best to make good decisions and I'll try to be a responsible steward of the vote. But I'm not going to pretend like I don't get an all about it. Another one that makes my head hurt a little bit. Most improved. 
Yeah. Because again, improved like valuable is a squishy word. So where are you on the general sense? It's, I, I call this the J.E. Skeets Memorial Edict uh, that right. a second year player need not apply for, for most improved player. Do you feel like that is uh, a reasonable assumption or a reasonable supposition? Like you're supposed to get better from year one to year two, or do you feel like uh, in certain cir- circumstances that kind of guy can get on the list? Well, I had a guy this year who is in that category, the second year player. I don't have him winning it, but I have him as one of the top three. That's Jalen Williams in Oklahoma City. In my notes here, think, in my notes here, it says this year that is the Jalen Williams question. Yeah. Well, there you go. I, I felt like you were teaming me up. We've got this instant report, Dan. Like we're we're working this two man <laughs> game. Uh, no, I I I I think he deserves real consideration to win this award. Um, I didn't go that direction, but like he has gotten a lot better from year one to year two. And the interesting thing is he didn't come in as one of these uh, one and done guys, right? So yeah. it's not like, oh, he's 20 going to 21. I just think that part of it is the Chet influence. Chet opens up everything for their offense. It's so perfectly spaced. They are like the modern vanguard cutting edge on offense. And then defensively, same deal. But I've just been really impressed by how he closes games, how he wants you know, he wants to take the big shots. He wants to have the ball in his hands. His two-man uh, back-and-forth relationship with Shea, you know, in terms of like, hey, it's closing time. It's just seamless. Like, I really trust those guys. I think there's going to be a lot of stigma around the Thunder of like, oh, can they actually win a series? Because they're going to play a more experienced team in the first round. I trust these guys in late-game situations way more than I would trust the average team that has their age, right? Because they're probably what, like average age of 23 at this point or something like <laughs> yeah. that. But they they play way older than their birth dates suggest, right? So I think he's got to be in this mix. For me, I think there's another archetype, though, for most improved player. And it's the guy who has the breakout all-star season, right? And if you go back through in like the last 10 most improved players, you have a lot of guys going from like fringe all-star, didn't quite make it to like certified all-star and to yeah. probably perennial all-star, like in the future, right? Where it's like, hey, welcome to the club. We're going to salute you joining the club with this most improved player award. And the guy who hits that to me this year better than anyone else is Tyrese Maxey. Kind of a boring pick, I realize. Uh, but I think that's where I'm going to land because the tradition of this award recently suggests that's sort of what people are looking for. And he's gotten a lot better in a bigger role. And to me, the most important part was Philadelphia needed it. And like, it was like, they didn't have another plan, right? It's like, if Maxie's not ready to take a huge step forward, James Harden just screwed them for five years. And in fact, he was completely ready and more ready than I realized. And also like, not just that they, especially once Embiid was injured, they needed it, but like it empowered them to make the Harden deal they made at the time they made it. Like it became very clear three games into the season or whatever, like, no, you okay. We can rip the bandaid off. Like this is he is ready to go right now. Um, and that's it's interesting to me. So like, I had a, we had a conversation with my colleague Jake Fisher on No Cap Room a few weeks ago about this kind of thing. And Jake uh, lambasted me uh, over voting criteria. So I'm opening the door for Uh-oh. you to do the same. Because um, I've I'm in that uh, I'm one of the voters that has you know been part of that uh, electorate the last handful of years. And I often will make that evaluation of like. Did you make the hardest leap there is to make like from fringe all star to all NBA level, right? Like MVP caliber level. And so a few years ago, that was, I think, 2019, uh, 20, I voted for Luca for this award. Uh, 2021, 22, I voted for John Moran. Last year, I voted for SGA and Lowry Markin wound up winning. And Jake was like adamantly opposed to this framework of those guys are already getting awards. They're called all star births. They're called (laughs) all NBA births. You, 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 you know, you, you in, uh, invoked the name Kobe White earlier. Uh, and like, where's Kobe White in this conversation? He's sort of like the pivot point, right? Because there's a version of this vote. And I think I've said there's a version a number of times so far in this podcast. But there's a version of this vote that's like, why isn't that Jalen Brunson? Jalen Brunson went from yeah. like, didn't make the MVP or the All-Star team last year to might wind up on MVP ballots this year. Um, and I think maybe the argument is that he finished, I want to say, third last year. Yeah. So maybe it's that he already made the most improved, uh, you know, leap last year. But where does where in the, in the sort of definition of improvement, I guess, where does that kind of push and pull land for you? Like, should this be an award that's for your year six guy who all of a sudden now is putting up numbers or should this be for the like, no, now you've leveled up to the fringe of the all MVP conversation. 
Well, you know, I've heard some people even argue like Giannis's MVP season. Like he could have also been most improved, even though he had won most improved previously. Yeah, I want to say to I think me, it, I think it was Mike Prater wrote about like uh, Steph winning that, like the when right. he went from like the first MVP season to the unanimous MVP season, right? And like some of that is just right. to get the eyeballs, but some of that like there's an argument to be made. Wow, calling out Mike Prater. I hope he's not watching this, Dan. Jesus, I just, hope he is. Shouts out to you, Mike. <laughs> All right. Um, I go back to high school sports, okay? You guys are having the pizza party in in Oregon. It was at Round Table Pizza. They had the arcades. You know, you're getting like free refills on soda. Life is freaking good. <laughs> all the parents are invited. You're, all your friends are there. You're not going to give the most improved player award to the best player on the team. Right. He's not going to leave with both trophies in any way, in any sense, like it just is not how it's going to work. You're going to have 10 other guys on the team. We're like, what do you mean? I'm not the most like, no, he won everything. This uh, is just not how sports should work. So I have landed more in the camp of the guy who takes the leap for the first time. Uh, let's acknowledge the fact that he's, he's hopping into the club. I like that definition. I'm okay with the second year guy who just improves massively part of it too. Sometimes it's the same guy, depending on where their, their yeah. growth curve, like Jalen Williams, wasn't that far from being an all-star this year. Like, I didn't really, you know, uh, consider him that seriously. But like, you know, if there had been more injuries in the West, maybe he could have gotten himself into the the conversation. Um, he definitely could be in the conversation for All Star next year, especially if OKC just keeps this kind of thing going. Uh, so I guess the happy medium for me is the player who's breaking out for the first time. That's that's typically where I land, and, and frankly, it's the safest, the least controversial. I do think stepping back. If at any point in your life, whether you as a voter or the listeners as basketball fans genuinely get upset about the most improved player award, <laughs> you have a serious problem. You have a serious problem. Now, that doesn't mean that people shouldn't take it you know, seriously and you know, be responsible voters and put the homework in. This is not an award that has a legacy or that's going to impact your favorite player in terms of Hall of Fame or their reputation or their contracts. It's just not going to matter. It's kind of a pat on the head award. And so I would just encourage everyone to keep that context. Okay. One that does, and I will go one more and then <laughs> head to an ad break, but the one that does have it, an impact on contracts and legacies, et cetera, all NBA. And, yeah. uh, you know, you, you mentioned earlier the the feeling like you, you're trying to build the best roster of it. You also have to then wind up weighing like, do I give the team that won 14 more games than everybody else a second guy, even if in a vacuum, you might not say that Jalen Brown is a has had a better season than, I don't know, like DeMontis Sabonis, right? Or right. like, do the 44 win Kings get two guys? Do the 45 four win Lakers get two guys when one of those guys is LeBron James and the other one's Anthony Davis? Like the, I guess, pedigree versus in season, you know, overall success. Where do, does that kind of discussion hash out in your brain? Well, I have a very corny saying that I love that no one else has ever liked. So I'm really hoping oh, you'll give me a to this. laugh when I say that the most important number in basketball is actually a letter W. <laughs> Wins matter. Okay. <laughs> we have to prioritize winning. It's so important. It's the easiest thing to get lost in this analytical revolution of triple doubles and the first player to ever do this since. And you get sidetracked in all these different directions, uh, you know, because we're in this offensive scoring boom, we're in this era where like, you know, guys who are seven foot three, put the ball on the deck and go coast to coast. We're in this just kind of mind blowing uh, moment where prior to the all-star break, no one was playing defense for two months straight. It just wasn't happening. Right. So everybody's getting numbers. You have to, you, you got to separate, uh, you know, the, the wheat from the shaft. You got to understand who's truly impacting winning. And so that the, the on off stuff is really important to me. Plus minus stuff is really important to me. And a team's final win total, are they getting it done in close games so that they're winning those games rather than losing those games? Are they running circles around the Eastern Conference in a way that we have not seen basically ever? The last time I, I wrote about the gap between the Celtics and everybody else in the East, they were pushing the Heatles, you know, the LeBron Heatles and Jordan's Bulls for the most dominant regular season by an Eastern Conference team basically ever. Like that's nuts, right? So yeah, I'm I'm definitely going to give you know those guys consideration to have two uh, of the 15 spots on All NBA, especially if I'm not locked into hard you know positional designations. And Brown's been a guy in the past. It's like, is he a guard? Is he a forward? Where do you slide him? Like he can be a little bit tricky. So 
Uh, I, I would hope he would get one of these 15 spots. Again, I haven't penciled every single one of them sure. out, but in my mind, he's worthy of an all-NBA selection. I think he's had a phenomenal year. And another thing I take into account about this idea of like the most important uh, number is a W, it's okay to have your stats go down if you're unselfish. Jason Tatum's mm. numbers came back to earth. It's for the betterment of the team. If he took five more shots a game, his team would not be better, right? Because Porzingis wouldn't be as happy. There wouldn't be as much room for Drew Holiday to chip in here and there. The balance wouldn't be quite right. And so that's why, to me, Tatum has to be a top five MVP guy. And that's a nice way of saying he needs to be fifth on the ballot. But, uh, <laughs> you know, like we, we do want to reward guys who are doing this, you know, from the right spot. You go back to Tim Duncan. I mean, that guy was the most valuable player in the league a lot. Did he have the absolute best stats in the league um, all that many times? Probably not. But he was everything he was doing was contributing to winning. And I'm searching out for those kinds of um, characteristics when I'm weighing guys on all NBA because there's going to be a lot of guys with huge, huge numbers on bad teams who, to me, they don't even rate. You know, they're not even in this conversation. And typically, if you're not on a winning team, I won't put you on all NBA. It's a wonderful way to think about things. And you've given me, you've done, you've helped me. And then I still don't know what the hell I'm going to do. So that's, I think maybe the, be <laughs> the best place you can land in a conversation like this is I have a lot more to think about. And that pit in my stomach still grows and gnaws. Um, before we go any further, though, we're going to take a quick ad break. We will be right back with the closing five with Ben Golliver. Stick around. Welcome back to Divine Intervention. We're going to wrap up with something that we like to call the closing five, because as I'm sure you know, Ben Golliver, how you start, not nearly as important as how you finish. Mm. Five questions for our illustrious guest. Question number one. When you're not in gyms and on planes going to gyms, you are often about as far away from gyms as possible as anyone who follows you on Instagram knows. You get out into nature. You get out into the middle of nowhere. Here is my question. Why isn't hiking bullshit? Well, um, if you have to ask, don't come on the trails because we got enough people who are copying the flow. You know, it's become very popular. The pandemic... The pandemic sent national park attendance through the roof, made it a lot harder to park. You got all these like timed entry things. So I don't want to convince you. It's, you know, actually, Dan, it's pretty tough. You're going to sweat. It's a lot of sunshine. You know, you look like a guy who probably gets sunburned pretty easily. Am I right? <laughs> Extraordinarily uh, easily. You're going to you're going to hate hiking. Stay off the trails. Um, <laughs> for me, I love it because, look, our lives, basically, you're either in confined spaces on airplanes, confined spaces in uh, hotel rooms on the road or in super duper loud arenas with just nonstop noise. And so for me, it's like, what is the karmic balance to that? Walking around without deadlines and anything else, just aimlessly, you know, going through a place where if I run into a moose, great. If I don't see another person, great, even better, you know, and it's quiet, it's <laughs> serene. That's what I'm looking for. So it's just all about mental balance. That's all. If you run into a moose, that, that's not great, right? Like it's a little bit concerning. If you know what you're doing. Yeah, I know. That, and that would be an amateur response. You'd probably panic. It's fine. Um, wait, 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 okay. If you know what you're doing. Okay, so Ben, let me know. What am I doing if I walk into a moose? So moose have terrible eyesight, all right? So you you can convince them that you're bigger than them. Actually, I don't want to be giving advice on how to pester mooses on your show. Sorry, that's very like unethical. All I'm saying is you can get to places where you can um, view and not disturb moose and hopefully take pictures of them. I wanted, I went on a great moose safari in Maine with a, a guy who called himself Lone Wolf, kept a little, um, kept a little blade on his waist that made me a, somewhat uncomfortable and told me to meet up with him at the only stop sign in town. It was great. I mean, just these, these kinds of adventures you get into when you're serious about the, the outdoors. I'm trying to go to the Arctic Circle after the Paris Olympics this summer and, and hopefully see some Norwegian moose, which look a little bit different. And because there's so many hours of daylight up there, you have to meet up at 3.30 because the moose typically are most active at sunrise and sundown. So good luck with this, right? Um, but you can, you can do it in a responsible way. And, you know, the moose safari part, by the way, is not to shoot them, okay? It's, it's just to watch them I, and I'm take pictures I'm very glad you cleared that up. Yeah. I'm very glad you yeah. made Okay, I mean, once you talk, started talking about Lone Wolf and his blade, I started to get a little bit worried about oh, what was yeah. happening to our moose friends. No, no ritualistic, you know, nothing, nothing like that. Okay. Uh, nothing that's going to make 48 hours in a couple of years. Right. No, no <laughs> concerns. Uh, but no, it's, they're big, beautiful, majestic animals. Uh, you know, you want to stay out of their way. Like if it's rutting season and all that, but for the most part, you're going to be fine. 
Well, I didn't know where that was going, but I'm really glad it got to where it got to. Question number two, <laughs> we'll get a little bit more back on the beaten path here from the trails. Uh, you've been covering the NCAA tournament for the Washington Post, uh, pulling double duty, I believe, right? Um, at the men's and women's tournaments. I don't follow college ball super closely because I'm doing NBA most of the time. Uh, who's a player that has particularly caught your eye over these last few weeks? Somebody that you watched and were like, that's somebody I want to keep paying attention to. Well, there's only one answer to that. It's Caitlin Clark. And I, what I want to kind of convey to people, I got a chance to do a big feature on her last mm -hmm. year, and I, I went out to Iowa in January 2023. So she was a big deal and All-American, but she hadn't yet won Player of the Year. They hadn't yet gone on their um, on their you know deep final run. And I mean, she shows up to the interview early. She's locked in taking questions for 90 minutes. She's, you know, full tech wow. fleas. Like she's ready to hoop right now. If I asked her to play one-on-one, -on -one, she probably would have just worked me 21-0. I mean, she's just the absolute real deal. Such a genuine person. I think everybody could see it in her post-game press conferences. I mean, every single opportunity she has, she will take the high road and she will spread the gospel of the sport. So I can't sing her praises enough. But what I think she maybe hasn't gotten enough credit for, aside from the incredible shooting, the amazing passing, the leadership to bring this team all the way to the championship game two years in a row. She hasn't gotten enough credit for her focus amid the insane rise of fame. You know, sure. you go back a couple of years ago, what's the number, the television number for the women's national championship game? It's probably about four or five million, you know? This year, it's like approaching 20, right? And like, she is the main reason why everybody is tuned in, why everybody's locked in. Um, you know, she's been driving that interest. And when you reach that level of fame, you have the celebrities come into the game, you have all these cool link-ups with people. Uh, you know, it, there's a lot of benefits to that. But we always look back at LeBron and say, all things considered, he handled how famous he got really, really sure. well. But what I would point out is that occurred from like his sophomore year in high school to his rookie year in the NBA, right? Like it was this kind of gradual, steady rise to fame. And it's all hit Caitlin within 12 to 13 months, right? Where she just became the biggest deal on the planet. She's doing every advertisement for sponsors, uh, you know, during commercial breaks. You know, it's sometimes it's like she does halftime interviews on the Fox broadcast. They just put her stats at the bottom. It's pretty much the Caitlin show, like the Truman show is what we're living here. And I don't know how anyone would have been able to handle that better than she did. And we may look back and say, well, this was the absolute peak of her fame, right? She goes to WNBA. Maybe it's not quite the same. Fan bases are a little bit different pro and college when it comes to the women's sport. But she is on a Steph Curry level ambassador for basketball, and everybody needs to appreciate that. That's wonderful. I love that. Question number three. I mentioned earlier that you wrote Bubble Ball, a firsthand look at what it was like inside the Walt Disney World bubble. And I wanted to ask you about a you know, story about it. But the thing that struck me when I pulled it off the shelf this morning is that you dedicated the book to your grandma, Pat, and all librarians. So tell me a little bit about grandma, Pat, and why the library is special to you. Man, I didn't have any Kleenex, man. I'm going to tear up here. Uh, it's really sweet of you to ask that. No, she's the one who got me into writing. You know, it's it's amazing. You talked at the beginning about like writing draft Kevin Durant, the kind of the first time that I'd ever done any sports writing. My entire life, I loved basketball. My entire life, I loved reading about basketball. My entire life, I loved writing. And I never, ever conceived in high school, college, not until I was out of college, that you could put loving basketball and loving writing together right. uh, into a job like it never hit me it's like how stupid is this guy you know like <laughs> this guy's a moron like he's staring <laughs> right at his future and can't even see it and uh, she was the one obviously you know every every um you know christmas or birthday it would always be sports biographies sports books every time i go visit her in the summer as a kid she'd take me to the library they had this great book mobile um in western michigan i don't know if you know about those where they're sort of like mobile libraries yeah, yeah, yeah. and she would hype that up like it was the coolest thing it was like the sand dunes the mini golf course the whippy dip for ice cream and the book mobile like that was the mount rushmore <laughs> of west michigan activities and so, uh, you know, for me, it just, you know, she passed a few years ago, but uh, so she didn't get a chance to, to know that I wrote a book. But like when you're signing the contract to write the book, you're going through all the process of like, wow, this is actually going to be a real thing. Like They're going to let me do this. They're going to print these, Dan. Like These are going to be in stores. <laughs> like this is crazy. And I was it blew my mind because it was a weird time of the pandemic. And sure. you know, I'm walking into a Barnes and Noble and I'm just, you know, basically punching myself in the face. Can't even believe that the book's sitting right there in front of me. I bought my own book so many times, I couldn't even tell you this mail now to friends. Uh, but it's because of that pride factor, right? It's like, I feel like I'm I'm making good on her investment. That's sort of how I look at it. 
That's incredible. And what a, what a wonderful testament to the, you know, the, the impact that those people in our lives can have, you know, that's, that made as much as I want to hear about what was insane about the bubble, like that part, it made, you know, <laughs> that, that hits, hits me where it counts. So I'm glad I asked you about that instead. Abrupt pivot in question number four, Ben, a cosmic being beyond our understanding has for reasons surpassing our ability to comprehend them granted you Ben Golliver, the ability to pierce the veil of space and time and rectify the injury woes of one, just one, member of the Portland Trailblazers to restore oh. one player to full perfect health for the balance of his career. Just one. Who is it? Brandon Roy. Uh, you know, pretty, pretty easy answer. You know, I first started covering the Blazers in the 07-08 season. Hope sprang eternal, man. <laughs> Brandon, yeah. How many times did you write blogs that was like the Blazers record with Brandon Roy, LaMarcus Aldridge, and Greg Oden on the court is like the greatest team of all time, maybe better than the you know 96 Bulls, right? Like <laughs> right. that was the trio that felt like it was going to take over the NBA. And Aldridge wound up having basically a Hall of Fame career. Greg Oden, we know kind of what happened with Greg Oden. Brandon Roy, I think, was headed for a Hall of Fame career. It's really hard to know exactly where it would have gone because he came in late. You know, he had spent quite a bit of time at Washington and he, but he was an immediate impact guy. And if you're just guaranteeing him good knees, I think he's having a 15 year career and, you know, he would get uh, a lot of praise from his fellow stars, like guys like Kobe, those types of players would always single Brandon Roy out. And it wasn't in the like, Oh yeah, don't forget about the small market guy way. It was like, Holy cow, this guy gets buckets, he cooks, you know? Now, what's interesting about B-Roy is, like, maybe he didn't have the most modern game because it was a slowdown style. It was a lot of mid-range. He would work to his spots. Um, it wasn't this, like, hyper-optimized James Harden uh, type, of, uh, type of approach. But he was so much fun to watch. He was such a good post-game quote. I remember one of my first interviews that I ever felt like, wow, I really nailed it, was I was just sort of like, hey, Mr. Roy, like, how does it feel to be clutch? <laughs> Because he had hit some like game winners, you know, and he like walked me through his entire thought process of like, this is what's going on in your mind when you're taking shots that matter. Like the game's on the line. Here's how you have to approach it. Like, it, and I was just standing there like, you know, probably with khakis and like a, a tucked in button down looking like a complete dork, just eating up every <laughs> single word and like racing back to my laptop to type that up. Right. So those are like just priceless memories. And um, it's cool. He's had a, a post career in you know in basketball like high school coach and all those kinds of things and the Blazers need to retire his jersey it's time like just get it done I don't want to hear any more about next year next year next year give this man uh his due and uh, it would have been fun to watch that career honestly yeah if, if he was still playing in Portland do I ever move to LA I have to ask myself that question right because wow. it's like that's I mean, he was on that level. You know, I think it was like Kobe and then him when you're looking at the two guards from that era, you know, as, as Wade started to, to tail off a little bit, like it was going to be his league and he just never got the chance. I would heartily recommend anybody listening to this Google Brandon Roy could cook because I remember Ben Golliver writing that blog post at Blazer's Edge in 2011, I guess, um, about what Brandon Roy was when Brandon Roy, Roy was right, because it's the kind of writing that we want to do when we do this work. So if you are out there, uh, read that Brandon Roy could cook. Question number five. Uh, I mentioned your Instagram account earlier. Uh, one thing you do a lot that I love is you highlight like when one of your stories hits the front of the print edition of the sports section. Um, it's the kind of thing that I mean, I haven't written for a print newspaper in a, a long time, um, but it's the kind of thing that I feel like our digital native audience might not necessarily resonate or it might, they might not really grasp that. What kind of charge do you get out of knowing that you wrote your way to the front? Like when you get up there and you're like, my byline's there, front of the section, let alone A1, right? Like what kind of charge does that put into you? Oh, you love it. I mean, you're, I mean, it's not really a competition because we're all teammates, but like the amount of talent at the Washington Post is ridiculous on the sports desk. Like Sally Jenkins, like she should have the front reserved for her every day. Like there's the front of the front, you know? And so, I mean, it, it, it goes on from there. I mean, Jerry Brewer, I don't want to like start naming every single person because then I might forget someone then I, sure, you know, sure, I look sure. like a jerk. But it, you just feel like you're on this kind of dream team. And so you're there's only going to be four or five, six spots on any given day. So you better write well if you want to be in one of those spots. And, um, you know, obviously we follow the calendar. So like the NBA is big a certain time of year. So I'm more likely to get them at a, at a certain time versus others. But for me, the, the real charge is when I, I get the opportunity to do a big profile story 
uh, to really dig in on someone, introduce them to the audience. You know, like uh, for the first month of the season, I was following the Spurs pretty carefully and to kind of just get Victor Wembanyama's welcome to the NBA introduction. So like those kinds of stories to me, it feels a lot like the Sports Illustrated covers back when I was at, at SI. And so, yeah, I mean, it's it's cool from a print perspective. I have them mail the actual hard copies every once in a while. But, uh, you know, being out here in L.A., like 3,000 miles from the printing press, like sure. I, I don't get to see them that often. So I try to commemorate it and promote it a little bit um, on the Instagram. The other reason why I do that, though, is because we have like awesome designers, you know, the, who really lay out the pages and come out up with just the most amazing headlines. We had a headline the other day about Caitlin Clark and the women's tournament in Cleveland, which was like uh, a total eclipse and a, and, a, and a Clark, I think was the headline. <laughs> it was like, they just like nailed it. Sorry, I, I butchered that. But like we just these incredibly creative copywriters, headline writers and everything. And so that's part of the joy, too, is just like to see what they came up with to like help pitch your story. But yeah, I mean, it, it very similar to the SI covers. And I, I keep a lot of that stuff framed just because I'm a sports dork and I was reading sports pages, you know, probably when I was like six years old and subscribed to SI for kids and then SI for the last, whatever, 35 years. So that's just kind of, you know, again, it's all full circle, all part of the deal. You hear that, people? When you get the opportunity to shout out the designers and the copy editors, they that, they love. They don't get that kind of love that often. And if you do it, they love you forever. And that's why the people that uh, it's important to shout them out because you want to make sure they're catching the mistakes and they're making you look as good as humanly <laughs> possible. It's why whenever I get the opportunity, I shout out the people who make the art for the the images and yeah, the the copy desk behind it. Without them, you look can look silly. So it's very very good to do that. Uh, I love that. And I also love that we're going to move now into our last bit here, the weekly recommendation. Ben Golliver, it does not have to be about basketball. In fact, I almost insist it's not. Um, if there is something that you think is cool and good that would make the lives of the people listening maybe 1% better, something that you think is good that you would just share as a recommendation, could be anything. Past examples have included uh, making dinner for somebody to show them that you care about them. That was Rowan Nodgurney. Uh, uh, go outshine popsicles was Caitlin Cooper. Um, going to the library was uh, Katie Heindel. Um, all right. sorts of different things. I, I picked making baked ziti. That was one thing that I did. There's a lot of uh, ways you can go with all sorts of TV shows and movies and whatever. Ben Golliver, what is something that you would like to share with the people? I'm going to bring it full circle here. Uh, this entire conversation, I'm going to, you know, mix in libraries and books. I'm going to mix in some of the old sports illustrated stuff. I'm going to mix in hoops. Cause it's all about basketball. I'm going to mix in some talk about contributions to winning and becoming a great and so forth. People need to read this book. The Real Hoosiers Ooh. by Jack McCallum. I don't know if you've gotten into it yet. I don't know if anybody else has come on here and recommended it, but I read it in probably like 2.5 days flat. And I'm just like everybody else where I don't have the attention span at, like I used to for books. Like I have to kind of force myself to do it. This was to me like the ultimate page turner. I just flew through this book. And, you know, the, the short version is, you know, there's that famous basketball movie Hoosiers, which is set in the 1950s. This small, all white farm team wins the Indiana Basketball State Championship. And it really happened. And they're legends forever. Very few people know the team that they beat um, to, to go on their way to win that championship had Oscar Robertson as a sophomore on right. it. And it was an all black team from Indianapolis. And the next two years, Oscar Robertson basically lost one game, rose to prominence as the best player, arguably him or Larry Bird to ever come out of the state of Indiana, leads his all black high school, which was created as a matter of segregation. Like they, they forced everybody to go to this one school um, in the early 20th century. He leads them to two state championships. His senior year, they don't lose a single game. And they basically just usher in a complete new era, a revolution across the state of Indiana, which is basketball mad and loves high school hoops. They were the first all black team to ever win the championship in Indiana. So what Jack does just expertly is he he provides the backstory on Hoosiers. He provides the backstory on the school and like why it was created. He get, he takes you uh, in much more detail than we're accustomed into who Oscar Robertson was as an all time mm. great. And then he really lays out like what's the legacy here? Like how did this unfold? Uh, you know, within the racial climate of a state that was very very segregated at the start and has obviously uh, you know changed and, and integrated in ways that uh, you know we would all expect to have happened over the last uh, you know say fifty years of the twentieth century. It's amazing. He gets into some crazy racial violence stuff, you know, what these players were dealing with, um, what was just going on in terms of like lynchings in Indiana in the early 20th century. Like he just dives in deep. You will learn so much about basketball, but also just about 
life in the Midwest and and about Oscar Robertson too, a guy who I view as like kind of a forgotten NBA great. We associate him with triple doubles and like, oh, Westbrook's going to chase him and all that. Uh, he was a very important figure in the early NBA as a labor leader, uh, as just a star. And so you will love this book, Dan. Individually, I know you will, but I bet almost all your listeners will love it. It's like five star recommendation. I keep Jack owes me money for how hard I've been uh, you know, <laughs> selling this book everywhere I go. But it's like I can't stop talking about it. It's a great book. And I know you just had Jack on Greatest of All Talk to discuss it, too. So people should go check that out. We're going to re- make sure we plug Greatest of All Talk again at the end here. Um, that is a wonderful recommendation. I would look forward to checking out The Real Hoosiers by Jack McCallum. Um, mine is something that I came across my transom again the other night. I hadn't watched it in a little while. and I watched it again. Uh, Zodiac 2007, probably David Fincher's masterpiece, which uh, when you're talking about a guy that also made The Social Network and Gone Girl and Seven and Fight Club and a bunch of other stuff, that's uh, kind of saying a lot. Um, it's adapted from Robert Gray Smith's book about the hunt for the Zodiac Killer in and around San Francisco in the late 60s and 70s, uh, which is incredible in its own right. Um, wonderful performances from everybody in the movie, uh, headlined by Mark Ruffalo, Jake Gyllenhaal, Robert Downey Jr., my man Donald Logue, who uh, I've talked to on Twitter, and he said that we look like, we look like each other, which I really enjoyed. Wow. Um, he is in there. Nice. Uh, he's in there. Uh, one of many character actors that just shows up and throws heat. Uh, and then, you know, rains, uh, rains threes and gets out stage left. It is a gorgeous and harrowing story about obsession. It's a newspaper story. It's a police story. It's a true crime story. It is a story about obsession, about the way that looking for definitive answers uh, can prove maddening. Uh, sometimes they can elude your grasp, whether because you just can't prove them or maybe they were never there to begin with uh, and how that process can drive you insane, which makes it the perfect movie for awards anxiety season. We don't find definitive answers. All we can do is keep searching and working the evidence. And uh, that's where I'm going to now. You have to subscribe to Greatest of All Talk, a twice weekly NBA podcast that Ben does with our friend Andrew Sharp. Five bucks a month. You can visit greatestofalltalk.com for more details there. Uh, subscribe to The Washington Post. Democracy dies in darkness. We need Ben to keep cranking out these wonderful stories, getting to travel all over the great world of ours, covering the NBA and basketball writ large. Um, ben, anything else you'd like to point people to on the way out the door? No, you nailed it, man. I really appreciate it. I'm on Instagram at Ben Doc Oliver if they want to check out, you know, Moose photos at the front page of The Washington Post every once in a while. You can check me out there. You should absolutely be doing that. I'm really the, the amount of moose content. I didn't realize we were coming here today, but I'm so glad that we made it. Uh, you asked the question, man. You had to know we were going there. <laughs> well, one th- thank you very much, Ben. You're absolutely right. That's going to do it for this episode of Divine Intervention. <laughs> thank you so much to Ben Golliver for taking all this time to be with us and to lead me down the primrose path toward moose questions. Thank you to super producer John Gennaro for all that he does to make this show look and sound great. Vinny Goodwill will be back with a new episode of The Good Word tomorrow here on the Ball Don't Lie podcast feed. And I will be back with No Cap Room on Thursday. Uh, Wherever you're getting this podcast, five-star review, rate, share, subscribe, all those sorts of wonderful things. Helps with discoverability and growing the show. I think that's about it. Thank you so much for listening. Take care of yourself. You deserve it. (laughs) 